Hi, everybody. It's our last read aloud before spring break. And do you remember that yesterday when I ended? Do you remember? Peter had just put the two golden eyes up against the um, eyeglass, the spyglass, and then he put his eyes in the golden eyes. And the last sentence was, Peter felt himself falling through the open air until he landed headfirst against a flat rock and the world went silent. So now we're to part two called Onyx. Does anybody know what that means, Onyx? Maybe you could be like Beck. Beck's been looking up the words and then he lets me know what they mean. Onyx, O-N-Y-X. You guys look it up. Okay, ready for the, the um, title? I wouldn't tell you guys yesterday because the title is The Perfect Palace. Peter woke to find himself lying in a soft bed. The bed was so soft, in fact, that for a brief moment, do y'all want me just to wait? We don't have to start reading. We can wait because it's, it's part two. Don't you guys just want to wait until after spring break and then that way we can just start part two? No? All right. The bed was so soft, in fact, that for a brief moment, he thought himself floating in the troublesome lake again. The box of fantastic eyes was clenched safely in his arms. His muscles were sore, and he could feel a dent in his chest where the hinges had dug into his breastbone. He slowly pried his fingers away from the wood and massaged his stiff arms back to life. How long had he been holding the box like that? Just to be safe, he opened the lid and checked to make sure the eyes were still there. The black and green pairs sat in their individual eggshells, just like always. For a moment, he panicked. Where were the golden eyes? But then he touched his swollen eyelids and realized they were safely within his sockets. He slipped them out and placed them with the others inside the box. Drawing back his dense comforter, Peter tried to get a fix on his surroundings. The entire room reeked of some sickly perfume, no doubt named after a flower. So far as he could smell, there was no one nearby. He propped himself up and instantly grew dizzy. Feeling his head, he discovered that it was heavily bandaged. Was he injured? How badly? The bandaging was no expert job. It seemed that someone, a child most likely, had taken a giant ball of rags and clumsily tied them around his head. He pried back the dressing and found a deep, rather severe gash in his crown. The boy winced and his fingers probed the wound. Blood, the blood was several days old. He wondered how long he had been in this strange place. He hello, he said, falling back onto his, his great fluffy pillow. There was no reply. Can anyone hear me? Still no reply. The last thing Peter could remember was being in the just deserts. What had happened? He faintly recalled something about ravens and thieves and... <gasps> Sir Toad! He called weakly. He could neither hear nor smell his friend nearby. They had been poised together over some great chasm. They had tried using the golden eyes to escape together, but now Peter was completely alone. The boy's head began to throb and he set out a hand to steady himself. He remembered some kind of battle at the nest. There was chaos and screaming all around them. He faintly recalled the birds swooping to his defense and their leader, Captain Amos, trying to tell him something. There were definitely some pieces missing to this puzzle. Thinking of puzzles, Peter remembered the rhyme. He took a breath and concentrated and coaxing the words from his fuzzy mind. Kings a plenty, princes few. The raven scattered and seas withdrew. Only a stranger may bring relief, but darkness will reign unless he's... Good grief, a voice cried behind him. You can't be up, you're ill. Peter yelped and surprised. He hadn't realized someone was nearby. Who are you? He said, spinning around. A sweet voice chuckled. Oh, sir, I should think the more appropriate question is who are 
you. Hearing her speak, Peter could tell she meant him no harm. But where did she come from? And why did she call him Sir? Me? He said, stammering. My name's Justice. Um, Justice Trousers. You remember that Peter, who was not a skilled fibber on the best days, was suffering from an impressive head injury, which prevented him from coming up with anything more believable. Justice. Hmm. The woman pondered this for a moment. I don't think I've heard that name before. What does it mean? It's just a name. Peter fibbed again. The truth was, it was the last thing he remembered before hearing before escaping the nest. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Trousers. My name is Mrs. Molasses. It's an old word that means happiness and kindness. Peter knew full well that molasses meant no such thing and was actually a word for a sort of sticky sweet stuff used in hourglasses and candy, but he thought it rude to contradict her. Have any of you guys ever had molasses? I, I loved molasses. When I grew up in Kentucky, they um, had all, they would grow sorghum. You guys will have to look that up. And then they would put the sorghum through these big, huge press machines and it would make sorghum molasses. And then my grandmother would make biscuits and then we would eat molasses and butter. You guys will have to ask your parents if they've ever had molasses, if you haven't had it. Um, think of it's kind of like um, maple syrup, kind of, but a little bit thicker. So it's kind of like a maple syrup that's a jelly. That'd be a good description for it. So molasses. The woman continued, Sir, you are more than welcome in my home, but I insist you lie back down. I simply can't have you bleeding all over my nice clean floor. With that, she grabbed her, his shoulders and forced him back onto the pillow. You really did give me a fright, she went on, puffing slightly. What with that icky blood everywhere? It's a wonder I got it cleaned up before the stains could set. Peter felt the giant mess of rags wrapped around his crown and silently agreed with her. While Mrs. Molasses tucked him back into bed, the boy put his senses to work as best as his condition would allow. From her voice, he could tell Mrs. Molasses was definitely a grown-up. She reeked of the same sickly perfume as the rest of the room. Her hands were plump and soft, and she betrayed a shortness of breath when pulling up Peter's covers. By all indications, Mrs. Molasses seemed to be the sort of person usually referred to as jolly. What were those words you were saying when I walked in? She asked, fluffing a pillow. They sounded so pretty, so odd. Uh, what were they? The pain in his head was a dull throb now, and with each passing minute, he was growing more and more obtuse. Just a nursery rhyme, he said through a yawn. Nursery? She considered this. I don't think I've heard of that word, but I do like rhymes a great deal. Why don't you get some rest? And then we can nursery rhyme together in the morning. And with that, Mrs. Molasses pulled the covers tight around Peter and left him alone to fall asleep, which he did almost immediately. So she doesn't know the word nursery. She doesn't know the word justice. And she's called Mrs. Molasses. When Peter woke again, it was in panic. The eyes, he cried out, jolting up from his pillow. His entire body was drenched in sweat and his arms were empty. The last he could remember, the box had been tight against his chest. He faintly recalled the strange woman who had come and tucked him in, something no one had ever done before. And now the box was gone. It had all been a trick and he had fallen for it. Peter scrambled to his feet and searched the room. He raffled through empty dressers and frisked the immaculate floor. He could find no sign of the eyes. How could I be so stupid? He said, slamming a drawer. That woman's probably miles away from now. Yoo-hoo! Came a cheery voice directly behind him. Peter gave a start and stumbled forward. This was the second time the molasses woman had been able to sneak up on him. He suspected it was due to the fact that she and the room were both doused in the most awful perfume. The stuff seemed to be working on a sort of camouflage, which, along with her surprisingly light step, made the woman difficult to track. I was just off in my cleaning nook, she said, taking the box from under one arm and returning it to Peter. It was so dirty, I 
thought I'd just give it a teensy little spiffing up. Good as new. He checked the lock for scratches. You didn't open it, did you? The woman chuckled, wagging a finger. Oh, no. Very funny, sir. It has a lock on the front. No one can open those things. I honestly don't see why you'd keep a box like that at all, seeing as how getting inside is quite impossible. Peter didn't quite understand what she meant, but thought it best not to argue. Oh, I've got a key, he explained. Key? She plucked some errant leaves from a fig tree planted at the corner. Another one of your silly words. You certainly must come from a strange place, Mr. Trousers. Talking with this woman made Peter's head hurt, but he decided to persevere, hoping to learn something about his current predicament. Where are we? What is this place? Oh, not place, my good sir. Palace, she sighed. The most perfect palace in the world. How long have I been here in this palace? Well, hmm. When I found you, you were lying in the middle of the courtyard, bleeding like a fountain. She chirped. I took you home with me, dressed your wounds, and set you to sleep right in this very bed. Three days later, you woke up and introduced yourself. Do you recall that? After that, you slept another two days, and ta-da, here we are. I've been here for five days, he said, struggling to do the math. No, three days, then two days. Five is something else altogether. I think. <laughs> She's funny. And you're certain I was alone? Peter was growing anxious to learn what had become of Sir Toad. Ooh, alone as a lemon drop, she said. The boy bowed his head. His friend had not made it across the chasm. For all he knew, Sir Toad was still fighting in that awful battle, and it was all his fault. The thought, thought feel, filled him with pain, the twin aches of loneliness and guilt. Oh, speaking of lemon drops, Mrs. Molasses continued cheerily, are you hungry? While Peter felt too distraught to eat, his body disagreed. It responded to the question with a long, low grumble. Oh, sounds like I am, he said embarrassed. Mrs. Molasses clapped. Oh, splendid. Then come along, Mr. Trousers. Do I have a treat for you? Peter and Mrs. Molasses bustled down long corridors and staircases, all of which smelled like fresh soap. Doors lined every hall, marking a separate room for each citizen. Notice how perfectly clean these vestibules are, she would say, extending arms to her left and right as they went. The king himself sees that they are scrubbed each and every night. Peter had since removed the racks from his head and was wearing his usual bandage around his empty sockets. If Mrs. Molasses noticed the change, she chose not to mention it. Peter darted from side to side as they walked, trying to take in every detail he could. There were lots of people about. They all smelled, smelled sweet and sounded happy. Every few feet, Mrs. Molasses would stop to introduce her guest to another neighbor. Yoo-hoo, Mr. Bonnet. This is my new friend, Mr. Trousers. I found him dying in my courtyard. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir, the person would exclaim, shaking Peter's hand vigorously. We're always happy to have visitors here in the palace. There would follow an inevitable pause, and then, actually, we've never had any visitors before, but we're certainly happy to have you. They worked their way to a vaulted path that Peter thought might be a bridge. Sir Toad would have told him exactly what he was seeing, but he was gone now. The boy realized with shame how much he had taken his friend for granted in the desert. Sir Toad had tried to warn him against trusting the thieves, but Peter wouldn't listen. He had treated the knight as little more than a hindrance, stuffing him away in the bottom of his bag. Despite everything, Sir Toad sacrificed himself so that Peter could complete their quest. The boy swore to himself that he would do just that, no matter the cost, he whispered. His first step would be, would be to verify that this was, in fact, the vanished kingdom. From what he could tell, the palace resembled Professor Cake's description. There was a vine-covered wall lining the outside. Balconies, bridges, and stairways ran in all different directions. Every inch of the place was carved from solid rock and furnished with lovely gardens. It must have taken a long time to build this palace, he said to Mrs. Molasses. Oh, years and years, she replied. Our king made the entire thing with his bare hands. Imagine that, Mr. Trousers. 
Why do you call me mister? Peter said. This particular question had been bothering him for some time. Because you, Mr. Trousers, are a man, she explained. Granted, a rather short one. But still, in our kingdom, we call all men Mr. So-and-so, and all women Mrs. So-and-so. So I don't know how it works where you're from, she gasped, touching his arm. Oh, heavens, I do hope it's not the other way around. That would be most embarrassing. No, it's, it's like that where I'm from, too. Everyone calls me Mr. Peter did not want to pursue the point further. Still, it was strange for this woman to be talking to him like he was a grown-up. Mrs. Molasses, how old are you? He asked, not understanding that such a question was never to be asked of jolly women. We've discussed this, haven't we? We don't ask women how old they are, even though you all insist on asking me. And of course, then Calvin guessed it correctly. And so now we all know Miss Bouse's age, so turn to your parents, tell them how old Miss Bouse is. We will not know how Miss old Mrs. Molasses is, though. Old, she asked. When was your birthday? Birthday? I'm not sure I understand you. That word sounds sort of familiar. Birthday. Birthday. Forget it, Peter said. He wasn't sure he knew how to explain what a birthday was to someone who didn't already know. Oh, Mrs. Molasses snapped her fingers. I bet you meant to say bathroom. You wanted to know where our bathroom was, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Um, I never forget to wash my hands before eating, the boy said, offering his least convincing lie to date. Mrs. Molasses led Peter to a bathroom along one corridor. Even the toilets, he noted, smelled clean and fresh. He washed his right palm, which had been cut rather badly during the fight at the nest. The pain took him back to those final terrifying moments on the balcony. Perched above the yawning chasm, talons clawing at his clothes, he remembered Sir Toad's voice in his ear. The weight of his friend's hooves as the knight jumped from his shoulders. Put the ice in now, he had cried as the planks snapped beneath them. Yoo-hoo, Mr. Trousers, Mrs. Molasses' his voice rang from the outside corridor. We wouldn't, shouldn't, sorry, let me try again. We shouldn't want to miss our supper. Peter forced himself back to the present. He stepped outside, drying his hands on the tail of his shirt as little boys do, and followed Mrs. Molasses into the eating hall. The eating hall was a great open courtyard surrounded by stone pillars. Peter could hear water pouring down from spigots high above. The water flowed into a shallow stream that ran under footbridges and planters around the perimeter. There's the word perimeter again. The center floor was occupied by an enormous table, big enough for hundreds. And like everything else in the palace, this table was made of wood. Cut into its surface was a shallow moat filled with water. Large serving platters drifted along the surface, piled high with every type of food imaginable. People laughed and chatted, taking their seats around the table. People could hear a dozen birds singing from their pedestals. These birds were not singing in the whistle way that he was accustomed to. Instead, they were actually singing. Their little voices rang out in perfect harmony. A perfect end to a perfect day. We love our king, hip hip hooray. Peter listened as they took a short breath. Let me see how long this is. How much in our time? Oh, we can do it. We got this. And sang the rhyme again and again and again. He noticed that they seemed to mumble the line about the king every time. These birds know about rhyming, he thought to himself. Maybe they could help me figure out how my riddle ends. Each warbling voice was accompanied by a faint jingling sound that the master thief's ears couldn't quite identify. He decided to investigate the sound after dinner. In the meantime, he could smell the feast floating before him, and his stomach was demanding its due. Peter took his seat and started to fill his plate with food. But before he was able to take a bite, Mrs. Molasses and a woman named Mrs. Sunshine each seized one of his hands. The entire table raised their arms, saying, Long live the king in unison. The birds joined them with somewhat less enthusiasm. Long live the king. Peter mulled the words over in his mind. There was something familiar about that phrase. Do y'all remember where we heard it? Surely you do, right? Wasn't that the rallying cry of the ravens in the just deserts? 
but somehow it sounded different the way Mrs. Molasses and her friend said it. The food smelled just as Mrs. Molasses had described it. Absolutely perfect. The honey crepes were thick and tender. The oak loin was ripe and juicy. For drinking, everyone had goblets of whole cream. It was a feast beyond Peter's wildest imaginings. But every time he took a bite, his taste buds caught a faint, earthy bitterness beneath the surface. And no matter how much he drank, he could never completely wash down the bad flavor. Still, it was food and his stomach appreciated the attention. Peter helped himself to plate after plate, all while eavesdropping on the conversations around him. For what he could tell, the whole palace gathered for a feast like this every night. Without a feast to cap it off, the day simply wouldn't be perfect now, would it? Mrs. Molasses said, dabbing her lips with a serviette. I got another one for you back. You ready? You have to, I'm going to spell it for you. Ready? S-E-R-V-I-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Dabbing her lips with a serviette. I would guess it was a napkin because of the context clues there because she's dabbing her lips, right? But S-E-R-V-I-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Okay, you got to look that up. Peter was starting to agree with her about this place being perfect. Everyone was polite, happy, and well-fed. He was even getting used to being called Sir. He thought about how much nicer his life would have been if someone like Mrs. Molasses had adopted him instead of nasty Mr. Seamus. The entire palace seemed as though it had been plucked straight from his own dreams, only not quite. Like the food, there was something behind the clean floors and cheery voices that made him a little uneasy. She does seem a little... I mean, that she doesn't know those words, and she's, everything's perfect. It makes you kind of think something's not perfect, right? Just then, the air was split by a deafening sound. Clang! It echoed across the courtyard, shaking the foundation. Bedtime! Bedtime! The people screamed, throwing goblets and forks from their hands and instantly leaping to their feet. Every one of their voices tinged with the unmistakable sound of terror. Clang! The noise came again. This time, Peter recognized it as the bell of a giant clock, but much larger than the one he grew up with. He thought it strange that he hadn't heard the hands moving during supper. The clock chimed again and again, shaking the plates and cutlery. What's happening? He said as Mrs. Molasses dragged him from his seat at the table. Oh, what about the mess? What about dessert? <gasps> no time for questions. She was pushing him through the crowd. We must get home for tuck-in. Despite her size, the woman was surprisingly fast, and it was all Peter could do to keep up. He tried to get her to slow down, but it was no use. With each chime of the clock, she and the others grew more and more terrified. As they frantically raced up bridges and stairways, the perfect palace was transformed into sheer pandemonium. It means craziness. Mrs. Molasses rounded a corner and thrust Peter into her home. Safe! She dove in after him and slammed the door, still panting, still trembling. One mustn't ever drag their heels to tuck in or else. And her words trailed off as some unspeakable fear caught her throat. Or else what? He asked gently. Mrs. Molasses swallowed, pushing the fear back down. Or else you won't get enough sleep, Mr. Trousers. She smoothed her apron and repinned her hair. Off to bed now. I don't believe her one bit, do you? Peter knew she wasn't telling the truth. Like all adults, Mrs. Molasses made the mistake of thinking that people simply believed what they, what they were told. But Peter, even more than most, had a knack for picking out false notes. And in this moment, Mrs. Molasses' cheery tone sounding nothing, if not false. He followed his host into the spare bedroom. The great bell was still chiming. Gosh, he said in his most innocent voice, that giant clock sure is fancy. Clock? She said, confused. Oh, you mean the bedtime bell. Never you mind that. It's just a bit of the king's magic to help tuck us in. The boy was confused by her explanation. He had never heard anyone refer to a clock as magic before. The woman helped him into bed, changing the subject. Whew, I'm stuffed. Wasn't that a simply perfect supper? The bedtime bell struck its final chime, and then Peter heard a deep, clockwork rumble that ticked and whirred all around them. 
behind the walls, under the floor, above the ceiling. It was as though the very stones were alive. Mrs. Molasses happily went on with her work, paying no, no notice to the trembling houseplants and furniture. The rumbling stopped as abruptly as it had begun, ending with a sure thud. The sound was familiar to Peter's ears. A dead bolt had slid tight across Mrs. Molasses' front door. He could hear the thud of dozens of other dead bolts doing the same all down the corridor. Somehow, the clockwork was locking all the doors in the palace. At last, there was silence once more. Mrs. Molasses put the finishing touches on Peter's bed, softly humming the bird song from supper. A perfect end to a perfect day. We love our king. Hip, hip, hooray. Then, all snug, she said, patting Peter's bandaged head. And just think, we get to do it all again tomorrow. She blew out the candle and shuffled off to her own perfect bedroom. That's the end of the chapter. I can't tell you the next chapter. You have to wait all the way to the end of spring break. You've got a long way to wait. So I'll tell you the title. A Chat with Pickle. And then here's the picture. Can y'all see it? So, there you go. Let's see, where, how far are we here? We're about halfway through the book right now. About halfway. We're on chapter 15, page 176. Did everybody get the words down that we need to look up? Onyx and serviette. Okay. Well, I'll miss you guys, but we'll finish the book when we get back from um, spring break. Okay? Everybody get outside. Have fun. Play. Be creative. Build. Do all those things that you always are wanting to do and don't have time to do. Okay? Bye.